Now we are honored to welcome the next panel, which is going to talk about district and school accountability. What we're really talking about is the report cards that assess the quality of our schools and have become a growing policy issue in many of your states. They've been getting more and more attention because report cards are complex and they're raising concerns and serious discussions about how they can best be used. That's why ECS took on this special project to look into what schools and states are doing with report cards and the metrics included in them. We looked at what gets measured in assessing school performance, what information is actually reported to the public, and what types of systems, such as letter grades or categories, are used to rate schools. And here to talk about the project's findings are members who were engaged with part of our national thinkers meeting. First, we have John Claude Brizard, the former CEO of the Chicago Public Schools and president of Upspring Education Group. Next, we have Patricia Levesque, CEO of the Foundation for Excellence in Education, a group founded by former Governor Jeb Bush. Also joining us is Sean McComb, the 2014 National Teacher of the Year from Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts. And Dr. Uri Treisman, Professor and Executive Director of the Charles A. Dana Center at the University of Texas at Austin. This session will be moderated by Christopher Cross, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Education and consultant for the Broad and C.S. Mott Foundations. And I'd like to note that Mr. Cross and Dr. Treisman both currently serve as ECS Distinguished Senior Fellows, along with Joan Lombardi and Joanne Weiss. These fellows are helping ECS identify and address important education issues and working with the states to serve you best. You can find more about our four distinguished senior fellows on page 25 in your program. Now as everyone gets settled, I want to share a quick story about the report that we released just a few weeks ago. This is involving June Atkinson, who is the state superintendent of schools in North Carolina and the incoming chair of the Council of Chief State School Officers. North Carolina is one of the 13 states that this report highlighted as really including all five of the accountability measures in their calculations for schools, but also reporting those metrics to the public in a meaningful way so that parents can make choices about where to send their sons or daughters to school. I had the honor of speaking two weeks ago at an event with one of Superintendent Atkinson's deputies who talked about how even though North Carolina was rated as one of the best states in this report, they still were able to learn a lot about other metrics states are using that they should be considering in their policies. And that's just another example of how the ECS research is there to help you as you're looking for ways to enhance the policies and the outcomes for your states. And with that, I'm honored to turn the mic over to Chris Cross and hopefully a meaningful plenary discussion. Thank you, everyone, and good morning. Um, the report that Jeremy mentions is out, available on the tables out here, and if you haven't seen it, I would urge you to pick it up. As mentioned, this is talking about school accountability, not teacher accountability, not states, but school accountability, and obviously from that district accountability as well. Uh, there are some key takeaways that we hope will emerge from your reading of the report in this discussion including understanding and describing those key recommendations and the political difficulties of getting it right. Uh, because as those of you who have been involved in these discussions, there's a lot in terms of getting it right. Um, this report is an analysis of the metrics used by states to measure school performance, what gets measured, as well as the information and metrics schools must report to the public on their report cards. In other words, what gets reported. As well as the type of systems used to rate schools, like letter grades, categories, et cetera, which are growing in terms of their use around the country. What we hope to do is have an in-depth conversation about what <coughs> states are doing and what you should be doing to make it better. The report discusses five essential indicators, achievement, growth and academic progress, closing achievement gaps, graduation rates, and post-secondary and career readiness. Now I'd like to pose a series of questions and a discussion. And I would also like to point out that this is a two-part discussion. This will go until approximately 9.30. At 11.15 and Federal B, 
virtually this entire panel plus uh, an additional member uh, of the original panel that did this work will be in, in Federal B for about another hour to discuss this. So what we don't get answered here, uh, and you will have a chance to ask questions or to jot them down, come to Federal B at 11.15 and we can continue that. So the first thing I'm going to ask the, uh, ask the panel to do is what's the greatest, ben discuss is what's the greatest benefit of these report cards? And I'm going to begin at the opposite end with Uri and ask you and then let's come across. I think the transparency um, is the most valuable feature of these report cards. And it's important because it's a tool for building broader public support for public education. We have a major problem in communities where a significant portion of the adults do not have children in public schools. And these kinds of instruments are powerful resources for engaging them in the debates about public education and giving them a role in it. Okay, Sean? I, I see as benefits that it's, it's easy for adults to access these report cards and to digest the report cards. I think it provides some simplicity in communicating a large picture idea of what's happening in schools. And I agree that it can be part of beginning a conversation about identifying places where we need to increase resources and supports for schools that, that are identified as in need. I think those are some of the benefits. Patricia. So uh, let me start off by thanking Jeremy and ECS for even pulling our panel together. I think we had a really rich discussion in December. And we had folks from the left and the right and folks from, you know, that worked at, at the state level all the way down to the school level. And um, even though this panel's about school accountability, I would be remiss if I didn't say, after following Saul Khan, do we really need school accountability if we moved to a student-centered, competency-based model? Mm -hmm. And the answer would be no. We wouldn't actually need to have these school-level types of rating systems if our states in every single subject move to a place where kids didn't progress until they mastered the material. So, but since we're not there, we need to have some school accountability. And I think the question that was posed to our, our advisory group in December was, what's the purpose of a school accountability system? And to a person, we agreed, the purpose is to drive student learning through informing the public about how schools are doing. And so that's the benefit of having a school accountability system is we're going to change behavior and improve student outcomes by measuring, it's so clearly the two things that are important, what you measure and how you communicate what you measure. The reporting as well as the yeah. measuring. Jean-Claude. So Chris, I've, I think I've pivoted in the last 10 years about what I think is most important. So for me, it was always around what do we do to signal to school leaders as to what they have to do to drive to, to move student achievement. I think report cards do, can do a wonderful job of doing that, the right things to measure, the right things to signal, to push uh, our school principals, et cetera. But when I became a parent and had to find a school for my kid, it sort of flipped. Uh, as I looked to uh, sort of manage the school district and try to figure out where I live and where I go and what school I put my kid in, it became, a, for me, a parent sort of uh, tool. And as I navigated different systems in different states, I found most to be very difficult to really understand, to find ways to make simple decisions about where my kid's gonna go. So the test scores were important, but I wanted more than that, right? So trying to figure out uh, really the, the, the culture, which schools do I eliminate from my list, et cetera, uh, became quite difficult. So if that doesn't really speak to the folks who are using the system, I think we're missing, we're missing the boat. Yesterday afternoon, many of us were here in the same room when we heard the gentleman from Gallup talk about the polling that they have done and the research they have done. And the words care and support came up again and again in that conversation. Uh, it's quite a contrast, if you will, to the kinds of things that many and most states and districts and schools have been doing. But it raises the question, how do you measure it? How do you report it? And how do you balance that off uh, against these other factors which are discussed in the report and which we've talked about? So I'm gonna like, I'd like to start here by asking Sean to 
describe his feelings around this and then ask the others to weigh in on, on this as well. Sean, what do you think about this contrast? So I, I have to say that to a person, every state teacher that I spoke to after hearing the Gallup presentation yesterday thought that they hit the nail on the head, that, that it is so about engagement, that it, our work is so about creating hope and belief in students that they can go on and, and be able to have that entrepreneurial spirit to be able to go on and achieve great things. And I am proud to say, if you weren't in the room yesterday, Montgomery County, Maryland is including Gallup student polling as well as engagement polling of the adults in the building because that, that equates to climate. We, we know how important climate really is to supporting professionals in a school building that we are using that in Montgomery County and I think it can be a model to look at how, how do we do that? How do we measure some of those other factors that are so important um, in student learning? So, so the Gallup uh, feedback was, was absolutely important. I think that it really hit the nail on the head uh, for, for a lot of teachers in the room who were listening to that. But I also think that what measured is what matters. And we're looking at a ton of outputs. And I think that we've, we've as you said yesterday, put all our eggs in one basket. And so I think what we, what we really need to wrap our heads around is how do we really get a more balanced picture of what we're putting in these report cards? How do we really honor some of the challenges that our public schools are facing? There are, there are schools, neighboring districts, that have three to one ratios of school funding inputs. And we're all looking at the same measurements in the outputs. And so how do we look at some of that? How do we look at the environment and, the, and the, the climate? How do we look at what areas of strength different schools have? These are not reported on our report cards. I work at a school that has fantastic arts programs, but there's no way for that to be communicated on our report card. Yet it's something that so many parents value because we know that it supports creativity and, and that in, in our students. And so I think looking at some of these factors will help us because what's a danger of the report card? A danger of a, of a report card is that your lab the, the label you apply to a school, teachers take very personally. And we know that there are schools in all of our states that are facing incredible challenges and that it's really difficult to get highly qualified and highly effective teachers into these schools to do this important, important work. And we know that a lot of, a lot of what keeps teachers in those schools are the way that they feel valued in their workplace and a lot of that comes down to the engagement and what Gallup is talking about being able to measure. And so I think that we need to find that balance in our report cards so they can tell a more complete story of what our schools look like. Okay, but what is it that you would measure and how would you report it? I think, I think that we are, we're on the right track. Sometimes, sometimes we use the TELL survey. A lot of states use the TELL survey. I know we use it in Maryland, and I think that that's important because we need to report what the climates are like in our schools. We don't have, a, we don't have student voice in, in report cards largely except for their test scores, and I think students have a lot more to say other than their test scores. And I think that we also need to include com some community polling, and I think we need to include teacher voice as well. I think that that these surveys can be a part of a report card and can be something that's communicated with the public about how teachers feel supported in these schools, how the community fe feels about the school and what they're doing for their children, and what students feel about how, what's happening in their schools. Uri, you're anxious to get in on this. Yeah, first of all, thank you for those comments. That's exactly right. So back 40 years ago, Don Campbell said that the more any indicator is used to measure social progress, the more subject it is to corruption and the more likely it is to corrupt the processes it's designed to measure. So the danger is that school report cards have narrowed the purpose of education. And you can see it, particularly in the charters, where you often see no civics, no science. Right? So the trick is to rethink think back of the real purposes of public education, which are not only individual achievement, as Patricia mentioned, but also human development and socialization. We've gotten out of focus on the, on the individuation part of it to the socialization. It's not at all clear that all the measures in school report cards have to be psychometrically valid. It's enough for them to be measures of community approval of schools, students' approval and enjoyment of schools, and teachers' sense of the quality of life in their schools. And I think we need to come to a point of balance between objective measures that have psychometric validity and measures that resonate with the hopes of people to schools. Just one last thing about this. Around the school report card issue, it's fed into a negativism about schools that has turned what was a symbol of hope in American society into a symbol of government failure. 
We need to create opportunities for schools to present what they're best at and let the public judge the value of that. As a grandparent who has been trying to help guide a granddaughter to schools, I find great schools, for example, to provide that second look at a place which does reflect some of those comments. Obviously, any of this you have to take in and analyze in terms of what's the power of it, how many people are commenting, and that sort of thing. But to some degree, that does that, I think. Uh, Patricia, do you want to speak around this issue on care and support? Sure, um, and I will, I will probably be the, the opposite side of this issue in that I think school environment is really important, and the culture and the feeling and, and all of those types of things. And I think it's really important for parents to know how the teachers and the students uh, who are attending a school feel. I think it's important information for the principal and the superintendent to have. I'm not sure that it has to be part of the calculation of the actual school accountability system. And let me, let me explain why. Unless you are measuring things that are objective and outcomes based, there is the ability to game the system, right? So what you don't want is to have elements in your school accountability system where there can be a push to get as many parents to say good things about the school because, by God, it's going to help us move from here to here, and so that it's an, a, that it's an artificial type of, of culture. Mm -hmm. I think some states and some districts have done it really well. And when they have these customer surveys, um, stakeholder surveys as a part of their accountability system, it's very important to make it a, a smaller part of the overall calculation than measuring whether or not kids can actually read and write and do math and science. Because what's the ultimate goal here? When kids leave the school system, we want them to be able to read proficiently, do math, do science, social studies, if you, if you measure that in your state, because we want them to be able to be successful to go into a career or go into college for a career. So customer surveys, care and support, I think it's important information. I think states should, should measure them. I think school districts should. It should be part of how we look at, I know we're not here to talk about teacher evaluations, but I think it's really important that teachers are engaging their students. And it should be information that's collected and reported. States should use real caution in using it in a school accountability system and in how much, if they decide to use it, how much does it weigh in the overall grade or label of, of the school? Good. John Clark. Sure. So if I, if I may, uh, just read a couple of lines from a magazine I was reading recently. It says, these characteristics, readiness to study and learn, willingness to take on challenging tasks, perseverance through adversity, all happen to call it with achievement. This is not an education magazine. This is from Flying Magazine for pilots. Um, so <laughs> when, when you take a look at this uh, Martha King's push, this is what we're supposed to be doing in education, right? It's supposed to measure. So my wife is a cognitive scientist, and I'm going to channel her a bit. So she'd be mapping sort of what she calls non-academic cognitive competence. She hates the expression non-cognitive or soft skills because she says all of it is good in cognition. And she's been mapping everything from executive function, you know, self, um, um, self stress management, attachment, all the way up to self-direction, leadership, et cetera. Um, talking about, frankly, what we need to do to get kids to succeed in life. So we've got to look to be beyond this two-dimensional, perhaps one-dimensional system that we have to begin to not just uh, signal, but to begin to push school buildings and school institutions to move what we know is going to make things right. So there's a place to start, perhaps. One thing we used in Chicago was the five essentials from the University of Chicago. That might be a way to begin to measure school culture, attachment, et cetera. Um, but wonderful work right now is being done in California with the core districts. Don't love their nomenclature and terminology. They've got a long way to go, but it's a start for us to begin to figure out ways of incorporating these non-academic cognitive competencies in what we actually measure uh, to make sure we're pushing kids to being able to succeed in life in college, et cetera. Good. Thank you. And my apologies to people over on this side for having my back turned here. This is not a convenient setup. Um, there are other factors besides the non-cognitive and the things we've talked about in the report list these five areas I mentioned and the number of states, which range from 30 to on the high point to around 19 on the low point. But that's just one set. There are other factors that could be considered, and I want to ask about that. I had the privilege of chairing the Maryland State Board for several years, and when schools would come before us, as they did 
is they were in re what was back in 19, 20 years ago this month in restructuring. I got to the point where the first piece of data I would look at was the teacher absenteeism rate in that school. If it was a high absenteeism rate of teachers, forget students, that's another issue, but if it was teachers, you had a school that was in trouble because teachers didn't want to be there. So I use that as an illustration to ask each of the panelists, what are other factors besides the ones that we mentioned earlier? And those dealt with um, achievement, growth and academic progress, closing the achievement gaps, uh, graduation rates, and college and career readiness. What is another factor or factors that you'd like to see in there? I'll start with Jean-Claude. So I'd love to see um, disproportionality and suspension expulsion. Uh, I'd love to see special education referral rates um, in school. Teacher absenteeism, I think, is a wonderful piece to measure um, um, as well. But there are other things like the, 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 uh, the, the, what I call student engagement bucket, <laughs> right? And all the stuff that fits within that, that really begins to show you whether or not the school environment is nurturing and supportive of students to be able to succeed in academics. Patricia. So I, I think I want to expound on one of the recommendations of the core five, which is closing the achievement gap. And so there are a variety of ways that states can consider doing that. One of the things that, that I recommend is looking at how are the lowest performing quartile of kids, the lowest performing 25% of students in a school, how are they making progress? Because if a school is just focusing on its middle or its high flyers and is not actually bringing up the tail end, the kids that need the most help, then we're, gonna, we're not gonna really move the ball in, in our country. We're not really going to um, make sure that kids, are, kids are, are progressing. I would also urge states to be cautious in the number of indicators that they put into a school accountability system. So if you really want principals to focus on students performing, students having growth, your lowest performers, your graduation rates, you don't want to include other things that are very good, like teacher absenteeism, attendance rates, dropout rates, school safety, you know, school climate, all of these other things, they're good. They're good things to measure, but the, be careful in the balance of the, the, the criteria that you put in a school accountability system. You don't want your principals to be so distracted on the how to get there for student achievement that they're focused on these other things and not the end result of student achievement or student growth. I think there's a balance that has to be maintained. States are gonna have to decide how many and what those things are. But as a school principal, what are the different ways you're going to go about increasing student achievement? It may be cracking down or incentivizing teachers to, to not be absent. It may be improving attendance rates or school safety. It may be getting more kids into fine arts programs because you know that results in student achievement. Let principals decide what are the, the tools and the things they're going to focus on, knowing that they're going to be held accountable for. Are your kids making progress? Are they growing? Are they meeting standards? So there's a balance, I think, that needs to be had. Okay, very good. Sean, respond to that. I think that it, it, is, an, it is about the how, and it is about the way that we get there, and I think that principals should absolutely be thinking about that, but I think that we can measure that, and we can report that to the community and to the public so that principals do feel accountable for the how and for how we're doing that with the engagement piece. You know, Patricia made the comment earlier about gaming the system, and that's a fear with including more voice and polling. We need to be honest with ourselves that we've been gaming the system on test scores for years, that we've been reducing what we're our, our offering so that we're just focusing on math and reading. We've been gaming that system too. So if we're gonna just focus on, on these narrow measures, that those are gonna be gamed. But I think that we have, we have to include voice, we have to include some of these other factors, and, and, it, and each state does have to make a choice about what percentage and how they're gonna balance that. But we, but we need to understand that we're not all coming from the same place. We're, we're not all starting in the same place. And so I do think that something along the lines of a challenge index should be something we recognize, that there are schools that are starting with students who are far behind and are low resourced. And how are we finding gains with those students? How are we moving those students forward? I think that's got to be a part of the picture. I think that if you're looking to, to retain strong teachers in those environments, which is what we know children need, then we need, that, we need to give some, some oomph to those factors. Hurry. I like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's in Maryland. Don't steal him for time. No, the, be <laughs> the best way you can honor our generation is to surpass our accomplishments. Um, so a few things. 
Ironically, it's easier to game objective measures than broad measures of social views. So gaming happens all the time in this system. And it's an argument for broadening the measures and giving schools some choice in which measures reflect their culture. But I do think on the five measures, great progress has been made on transparency about achievement, gap closing, growth, right, grad rates. The one where we still need more work is college readiness. I think it's still slightly fewer than half the states that have report cards actually report college readiness. College only or college and career? Well, college and career, though that needs enormous amounts of work because we've been in a delusional view, had a delusional view that they're the same, right? So that needs some work. But I do think survey data, particularly of students, teachers, and community, need to be measures of what is essentially a vehicle for producing citizens. Tom Kane, who was at Gates and is now back at Harvard, uh, in his work with several districts, used something called the tripod survey, which is a survey of students. Uh, and I think the results, as I remember his work, reported the consistency of the value of that work in terms of looking at that data and what it showed as well. Uh, Patricia, as I recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, Florida was the first to do an A to F rating. Right. What's the danger, what's the advantage of it, and how do you prevent panic from occurring? Sure. So let me, let me start by asking the audience, how many in the audience have heard of A, B, C, D, F? How many know that A and B is good, D and F is bad, C means there's a lot of room for improvement? Let me, let me see your hands. So almost everyone in the audience, the ones that didn't raise their hands are either not listening or they didn't go to school in America, right? So everyone knows what A, B, C, D, F is. That's the power of using that particular label is that people understand and, and parents understand pretty quickly if the state is determining if that school is, is meeting most of the standards, needs improvement, or is, or is not meeting some of the standards that are being set. What's the danger in an ABCDF rating system? One danger is that if you're not measuring the right things, you're not gonna get the right outcomes. Another, another danger is that there is much more scrutiny of the calculation, right? So every state has to deal with graduation rates. How much do we make graduation rates count in a high school accountability system? Every state has to debate and tackle growth. Are we gonna measure it by simple growth, growth to a standard, normative or comparative type of growth? Are we gonna use a you know, value-added model for growth? Every state has to debate growth. It becomes the debate over the components in the accountability system becomes much more intense when you use A, B, C, D, F because people understand what the, out, the, the outcome, the outside label is. So do I recommend all 50 states use A, B, C, D, F? Absolutely not because some states are not gonna be able to handle the scrutiny and the, the political will that is necessary to, to maintain that system. Do I recommend states do it if they really are committed to um, driving student achievement and, and raising the bar and really focusing for an intense period of time on it, absolutely. It, it makes a difference. It, it drives student learning like, like um, almost no other type of reform that I've seen because you immediately get action. You immediately get pressure, positive pressure, which is what you want on making sure students are learning. But Patricia, the thing you hear is then it will scare good teachers away from those schools or even to go to those schools that are ranked low, sure. D or F. What's your reaction? What's been the experience sure. in those states that have done So it? I think there are a couple, I think there are two issues. And one is, remember, we're here to talk about school accountability system, which is one part of reform, right? It's one way to measure how a school's doing. There are so many other things that we're not talking about. How do states incentivize things through funding incentives? How do schools incentivize teachers to teach at a school by giving them extra pay for teaching in low performing or high risk or high minority schools? So we're not talking about all the other tools that a state or a school district or superintendent has, but 
what I can tell you is, I'll give you a story from our current commissioner of education. So Pam Stewart worked in St. John's County, I believe, in one of the lower performing schools that we had in the state back in 1999. The first year schools were graded. And she was a principal there. One of the, uh, the, when the state issued school grades, the school got a D. And she will tell you this, she hated the grading system. She thought it was terrible. She said, we are not a D school. And then she spent the next year at that school focusing on the things that were being measured. Student achievement, progress, all of those different things. And the next year, the school got a B. And she said, you know what? If I hadn't gotten that label that put pressure on me to get all the people in the, in the school focused on is each and every child learning, I wouldn't have done it. And she had been an educator for years. So while the, the grading system can cause pressure and can cause um, there to be angst at maybe going in and, and working at some of these harder to teach areas, the result has been that districts find the principal that can turn around a school, and finally these schools that have our most struggling kids are getting the attention that they need. Okay, Sean, do you want to respond to that issue of the grading? Maryland does not use grades. In that Maryland way. does not. Um, I, think that, I think that while there, there can be some pressure that, that's created, I think the idea of positive pressure is, can, can very much be a misnomer for a school climate and for a classroom. And I think that as we think about the, the pressure that, that is created, is it also accompanied by resources, by support? You know, what's happening to, to support that because of the, the pressure that's created by a letter grade? But I also think about my personal experience in the classroom, and I'm a high school English teacher, and so uh, in my first couple of years, I would, I would put the, you know, the big fat letter grade on the front of the paper and hand it to the student. And what I found was happening pretty quickly is that that first impression of the letter grade, if it wasn't you know, C, it was a C or D or something they, that they weren't happy with, they weren't reading all of the comments and the, the input that I was giving them to really move them right. forward. Instead, it was just that initial reaction to the letter grade that was becoming dismissive of everything else. And so I think about, do I think that's partially you know, a, a teenager, maybe, but I think it's also part of human nature that, that when we see this one letter that's supposed to encapsulate such a complex human process, that it doesn't do justice and it doesn't do us the service to move our students forward and to help our children move forward. I think it can, it can be a distractor from that. And I think that in, instead we need to say, if, we're, if we really are doing this so that we get the support from the district, right, that the district's providing the correct principal, then we need to trust our districts, our school boards, our superintendents to, to have the wherewithal to look to look deeper and to, to look at these multiple measures and really think about it deeply. And it doesn't have to be encapsulated by one letter grade. Sean, just quickly, did you change the way you handed papers back to students? I did, yeah. So, so, they get, so they get the comments, they get a rubric at the end, and then we conference and we discuss the final grade at the end after they've talked, talked to me about how they've looked at the comments and, and what their reaction is to Good. this. Good. Uri. Yep, I give them the comments first and a day later the grade. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so I think that a grading system has to reflect a theory of improvement. The theory of improvement behind ABCDF is that public pressure will lead schools to get better, and there's some truth to that. However, the research shows another way. The single best piece of education research in the last 25 years is Tony Bright's Organizing Schools for Improvement, supported across the political spectrum. And what it shows is that the key factor in school improvement is relational trust in schools that drives them to get better. Beautiful study of Chicago schools that shows that reading interventions, math interventions, only scale and affect all kids when there's strong relational trust catalyzed by a principle that teachers admire and teachers who work with each other. So we need both. This is not an A or B thing. I agree with Patricia that we need a clearly easy to understand set of measures that the public can get behind Right? because of the transparency and the public support it builds. And we need a nuanced set of measures that educators relate to. 
And this is, means that it'll be a little broader, but it can be owned by both constituencies. The question is how you get the public to understand and relate to a broader set of measures and understanding them, I think. Those of you in the audience can't see, we have a countdown clock here in front of us. So I'm going to warn the panel that when we reach five minutes, and we're at nine minutes and nine seconds at the moment, I'm going to ask each of you to give your final recommendation here about this issue and what you would like to be, see done in the way of improvement. But before we, we move to that, I want to give Jean-Claude a chance to respond on the ADAF. You were in Rochester, you were in Chicago. In neither place did you use that, did you? No, no, I, I did not. Um, in the fact, in Chicago, we resisted um, the idea of going to the F, although we got some political pressure to, to actually move in that direction. Um, so I, I'll talk about Chicago in a second, but I was in New York last week meeting with Common Farina's team on the exact similar issues. So I think, that, I think there is perhaps a balance that can be struck between having something that's sort of simple, um, easy for parents to understand, but yet gives educators the tools they need to actually get better. For, for me in Chicago, it was having a front, a forward-facing sort of uh, dashboard that was really so, so visual, <coughs> colorful, and simple to understand, but didn't aggregate to an A or to F, right? So three or four things, big things, that a parent or public could see to give you a, a pretty decent picture of a school. If you wanted to drill down, you could easily drill down, uh, which I think is what you saw in some of the states actually looked at the top marks for their school report cards. So easy to understand in the front end, but allows the new ones, the, the other stuff you need to see to tell you what is happening behind those aggregate um, sort of dashboard, I think is really critical for, for us to move forward. Okay. One final question before we move to the recommendations. I'm gonna start with Sean. The question of college and career readiness, we've all acknowledged, hasn't been well enough developed. What in your mind, you've been at the school eight years as I remember, what, and this is a school that serves a very diverse population, 51% free and reduced price lunch mm -hmm. as I recall. Tell me what you believe are the best indicators of college and career readiness. So that's a really tough question. That's 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> so, so there are some things that we know lead to success in careers like adaptability and self-control and these are really difficult things to measure. And I think that's part of why we're saying that, you know, measuring career readiness is a, is a really challenging uh, aspect to do. I think of the factors that we have in place, I think something like a student passing AP exam says that not only do they have academic achievement and knowledge in that moment on that test, but they also have done the work to really sustain their effort to learn some content knowledge that's required self-discipline, that's required some curiosity, that's required them um, to, to express some of these skills that will lead to career readiness down the road. So I think that a measure like that is better than an SA, a single SAT score that's happened at one moment in time that's just based on intelligence because, you know, those character right. factors are so much of what's okay. important. Briefly, Uri. So college and career readiness is the last measure that's the f measured by inputs rather than outputs. We need to measure it by the number of students who have completed dual and concurrent enrollment or college credit AP, IB courses, particularly in the bottom 25% of income. If we shift to an output measure, it will drive success much more quickly than if we stay with weak proxy measures for readiness. John claude So I, I, I agree with, um, with, with Yuri, but perhaps the most difficult thing to, to, I guess, figure out is, and I heard this one soup say, actually say this, can these students sit around a table in a whiteboard and argue strategy? Um, so question, how do you measure that? How do you get kids to actually that level? If they can do that, then they can succeed in life. And, and, and whatever the exit ramp is, we're all gonna go to work at the end, right? Um, so if you can find a way to, to put that into to the output measure, then we've got this at the answer. Right. <laughs> Patricia, quickly. I'm gonna agree with uh, Yuri and, and with Sean. Uh, AP, IB, ACE, dual credit, and don't forget industry certifications, yes. national industry certifications. Yes. Some kids that, that may not be choosing to pursue college, but want, you, you want them to graduate with Microsoft certification or AutoCAD or, or mechanics certificate, something that gives them a tool beyond high school to immediately go into a good career. So I think you have to have all of those yeah. things as part of a, of a good high school. A credential career. of some sort. Credential. Okay, the final lightning round is the question of the recommendations. 
each of you to go away with for the people in the audience and have your pencils handy. You'll get great wisdom from this. Jean-Claude. So I'll give, I'm going to give three. So one include what I call uh, non-academic cognitive measures like line engagement. I think it's really important. Two, holds the schools accountable for the next level, elementary to middle, middle to high school, high school to college persistence. And the last thing I'll say is that you know, schools can't succeed without district success and district reform. They're not islands. So you can't have one without measuring and looking at the other. So that's really critical to look at. Good. Patricia. So I think, um, again, the two, the two purposes were driving student achievement and informing the public. And so I would urge states to look carefully at how they're going to label their schools. A through F will work for some and will be very successful. Make sure you're using a label if you don't choose A through F that means something to parents and adults or you won't get change. I think you need to uh, seriously look at balancing the types of indicators and what you're measuring and the balance of those. And then a third thing that we haven't talked about in it, that is whenever a state sets a bar, it shouldn't just sit there at that bar. Because once you have schools achieve, you need to raise the bar. And so something that I would recommend every single state to adopt, it's something that in Florida we call a, a, the automatic school grading trigger, which means as you have in 75% or more of your schools achieving A or B or whatever your highest standard is, make sure the bar actually increases. Where, you, where the, the number of points or, or whatever the cut score increases, you have to raise the bar over time or you will stagnate. Doing it in an automatic way is really important. Sean. I think my overall recommendation is that if we're looking at a school report card as telling the story of a school, that we need to tell the whole story and so that we need to find some balance in there about te from teacher voice and student voice and community voice and, and what the culture is like in the school. I, I want my child to graduate knowing how to read and do math and, and, and be science, but I don't want them to lose a love of learning. I don't want him to lose his love of learning in the process. Yes, almost all of the above. But I do note that Patricia's theory of raising the bar means, by definition, we'll always have schools that are failing, no matter what their performance level actually is. So the biggest recommendation is that our system for grading schools had better be aligned with a realistic theory of school improvement. And that it needs to be balanced to reflect the culture of schools and objective measures that will guarantee public support of schools. Good, thank you. I know there are questions here. I would encourage you at the 1115 session in Federal B to come and ask those questions. We'll have much more time for that and much more time to get into a more in-depth discussion. Please join me in thanking the members of the panel. <laughs>